darkness you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. And great are you, Lord. It's your breath in our lungs, so we Peace be still, you are here so it is. 
step out onto the waters. Teach us faith that moves mountains. Father God, we ask that you teach us faith that allows us to be still when the waves crash around us. Church family, wherever you are, we invite you to continue to worship with us in spirit. As we partake of the word the Lord has prepared for us through our, our brother, our very own Angel Pereira. Happy Sabbath, church family. I hope that you guys are safe and sound wherever you are and in good health. Um, you know, I was texting with a friend this week and I said, man, I can't wait till we fill the sanctuary up with the church. Because we are the church. We are the body of Christ. And this building 
frankly, at the end of the day, it's just a building, you know. So I just want to say that you guys are missed. And um, before we get into the the word that I believe that God is trying to tell us today, I, I would appreciate if we could all just pray. Precious Father, thank you so much for the strength that you've been giving us in these hard times, Lord. I ask that we may open our hearts, that we may open our minds. God, hide me, hide me behind your cross, Lord. Make something out of my nothingness. Lord, all glory goes to you. In your name, amen. So when I was younger, I would, uh, I would bug my dad daily to teach me how to ride a bike. I had a bike. I just wanted him to teach me how to ride a bike. And I was like, Dad, can you take me to Grandma's house and teach me how to ride my bike? Please, please, please. And the reason why I wanted to go to Grandma's house is because she lived in a cul-de-sac. And it was just a straight road that would loop back around at the end. So my dad did. And in our little training montage, you know, he would be with me and, and, and push me and put his hands on my shoulders whenever I was feeling wobbly. And little by little, we started to take off the training wheels. And I had gained experience. And one day I was like, Dad, can you come with me to ride my bike? He's like, OK. And like most learn how to ride a bike stories, uh, my dad pulled the typical teaching move which was to push me until I started to get traction and until I, I got focused in what I was doing and then stop. So I didn't even notice when my dad stopped running with me or stopped being beside me because I just always thought he was there. And I was super focused on going to the end of the cul-de-sac and making that loop. So when I made that loop, I saw my dad right where we started and he was waving at me and he was, he's like, hey, come on, you guys, are, you can do it. I'm so proud of you. And instead of feeling like proud of myself and getting an extra win to push through and really learn how to ride my bike, I was paralyzed in fear. I was overcome with fear. I looked back and I looked forward to like, just make sure that that really was my dad. And I was like, you were, you were with me this whole time. What if I could have fallen? What if this, what if that? And I just became so afraid and so anxious that I may or may not have ran into a mailbox head first. <laughs> and now I look back and laugh and I think, man, if only I had remained focused, if only I hadn't lost my focus, you know, like if only I hadn't been afraid to keep going on my own. And now, now I notice that although I was pedaling on my own for that moment, I was never truly alone. My dad was still there. Everything he taught me was still valid and true. He was just letting me learn how to really pedal on my own. And I tell you this story because I know that God is trying to tell us to remain focused on him. God is trying to tell us that we need to trust him and his way of doing things. He's already taught us how to pedal. Right now, we just have to learn how to navigate our lives towards him. Ladies and gentlemen, we are living in some scary times. You know, almost every time I turn on the TV, it's some type of bad news and some type of information that just makes my heart drop. So how about starting today, we stop talking about bad news and we get into the good news. How about we stop worrying about the waves and, and, and the storms in our lives and we start to worship the way maker? How about we start to change our focus from fear to faith, because God is making a path for us regardless of our fear. By that last sentence, you might have caught on to what Bible story we're going to be talking about today, and it's found in Matthew 14, 22. And if possible, I want us all to go find a hard copy, go find a physical Bible that you can open, because I believe in the power of of the word of God. I believe that once you open the Bible and where two or three are gathered, even though we may not be gathered physically, we're gathered spiritually and God is there. You know, in these hard times, people are so quick to say, God, where are you in all of these troubling times? Why can't I hear you? Why can't I feel you? Where are you? But their Bibles are sitting on a shelf collecting dust. You know, you're not going to be able to hear and find him if you don't know where to start looking. So, for today, let's put our distractions away. Let's stop binge watching. Let's stop worrying. Let's stop stressing and start receiving God's presence in our life. Union College made sure that I understood 
that every Friday night they would say the Hebrew word for, sh- for Sabbath is Shabbat. And Shabbat means to stop. So let's all just stop worrying. Let's stop thinking about what if and when and, and how come. And let's just understand that God is trying to bless us and teach us today. So like I said, we're reading in Matthew 14, 22. I'm going to start reading. Immediately after this, Jesus insisted that his disciples get back into the boat and cross to the other side of the lake while he sent the people home. After sending them home, he went up into the hills by himself to pray. Night fell and he was there alone. Meanwhile, the disciples were in trouble far away from the land for a strong wind had risen and they were fighting heavy waves. So a little bit of context. Jesus has just finished feeding 5,000 plus people. You know, it only says that 5,000 men were present. So this isn't including women and children. So Jesus has just spent an incredible amount of spiritual energy to fill people's hearts and to fill people's tummies. And now he's like, I'm tired. Guys, I want some social distancing. Guys, get in the boat. Go to the other side of the lake. I'll send the people home. But right now, I just want to have that personal time with my source of strength. I want to realign, re-up, and refocus my connection with the Father. And, you know, I feel like this is something that we just kind of skim through when we read the story. Um, But Jesus is fully divine and fully human. And if Jesus, being the perfect Lamb of God, had to reconnect with God, spent intentional time with God, why do we think that we can meander through our lives without doing what He did? You know, when we don't do that, when we don't spend our time with God when we're emotionally and spiritually spent, we end up being in trouble like the disciples are. See, when we try to plan through and navigate our own storms and we try to to find our own solutions in life, we always end up like the disciples who right now are currently in trouble far away from the land. Verse 24, it says, Meanwhile, the the disciples were in trouble far away from the land. It wasn't because they were far away from the land that they were in trouble. It's because they were far away from Jesus. Jesus was their safety, not the land. And you know what? Sometimes um, the younger people that I talk to and that I mentor, they're always saying, Angel, I just, I kind of feel far from God. I feel that like we just don't have that connection anymore. And I I just kind of want to ask them like, well, where are you? Are you close to the land? Are you close to Jesus? Because guess what? Jesus is always close to you. There's never a place that you don't go that Jesus just stops. And like a dad teaching his son how to ride his bike lets you do it on his own and just waves. No, no, no. He wants us to pursue him because he's pursuing us. But he is always every step of the way with us because he is so madly in love with you. And I want to tell that to anyone who's who might feel distant from God today. Open up your word. Get to know him because he is always with you and he has never abandoned you. So let's keep reading. We're in verse verse 25. About three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came towards them walking on the water. When the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were terrified in their fear. They cried out, it's a ghost. But Jesus spoke to them at once and said, don't be afraid. He said, take courage for I am here. Now, an interesting fact about me is that I was born October 31st, 1995. Yes, I was born on Halloween. And usually when I tell that to people, they're like, oh, that's so cool. You're born on Halloween. You probably got double the the candy, right? Because you went trick-or-treating and then you had candy from your birthday. That's so awesome. (laughs) No, no, it, it wasn't awesome. It wasn't awesome. So I lived in Florida and many times I could never have my birthday party on the day of my birthday because my friends would go to this, this thing called Halloween Horror Nights, which was Universal had like half off tickets and they would just go there and they would ride rides and be afraid. And also, when I was younger, people used to tease the fact that I was born on Halloween. They would say, oh, your name is Angel and you were born on the devil's birthday on Halloween? Are you are you a fallen angel? Are you a bad angel? And it makes no sense. I know it makes no sense now. But when I was younger, I was like, no, that's, that's not true. You know, so it, it kind of hurt my feelings. And the third reason why I hate the fact that my birthday was on Halloween is because I just don't like what Halloween stands for. You know, it promotes an atmosphere of fear. Everywhere you go, every commercial, every corner you turn, there's always some like skeleton or vampire just, you know, trying to scare you. And and that's not for me. 
Now, jumping back into the Bible, diving into this story, I don't blame the disciples for being terrified. You know, many of them were fishermen. Many of them were facing their biggest fear. You know, I could see the fishermen fishing daily before Jesus was there, and they're probably like, dude, man, imagine if we if we if we shipwrecked. Imagine if we if we just drowned. That would be horrible. And like, yeah, man, it's horrible. So that was probably their biggest fear. And now they're in the eye of the storm. They are facing their biggest fear. And they have an atmosphere of just scary vibes all around them. And I want to say that it's okay to fear. But fear, fear is a big problem for our faith. See, because fear makes us distort our vision of Christ. Because they saw a figure walking on the water. And instead of thinking... That's my Jesus. That's my best friend coming to save us. They thought that's a ghost. Fear distorts our vision of Christ. You know, fear is a big problem for our faith because faith is hope in the things unseen. And fear makes us terrified of the things unseen. But Jesus, ladies and gentlemen, Jesus knows that the enemy wants us to live in fear. So he comes in the fear, in the scary moments, and he says, I am here. Guys, I am alive. I am not a ghost. I am your defender. I am your provider. I am your healer. And I am here to save you in these scary times. If it wasn't so, if Jesus wasn't so intentional as to say, do not be afraid. I am here. God wouldn't have made sure that his word wasn't inspired 365 times to have been written that variation of the phrase. 365 times in the Bible, a variation of the phrase, do not fear, do not be afraid, is written. One for every day of the year. Because God knows that we're human. Being afraid of things is in our nature. But God is saying, fear not. This world may be scary, but I have overcome the world, and I am standing in the middle of the storm, and I am fighting for you. So let your hope in me have more traction than fear in your life. God wants us to walk in fear. No, sorry. God wants us to walk in faith, not tread in fear. And that's exactly what we see Peter do here. Verse 28 says, Then Peter called to him, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come to you walking on the water. Yes, come, Jesus said. So Peter went over the side of the boat and walked on the water toward Jesus. But when he saw the strong winds and waves, he was terrified and began to sink. And he said, save me, Lord, he shouted. Jesus immediately, immediately reached out and grabbed him and said, ye of little faith, why did you doubt me? I love the fact that Peter said, tell me to come to you. You know, because if I was Peter, I definitely wouldn't have phrased it like that. Sorry, church. I'm just being honest. If I were Peter and I was in a sinking boat and there was a storm around me, I wouldn't have said, Lord, call me out into the storm. Tell me to come to you. I would have been like, Jesus, if that is you, stop playing. Get in the boat. Let's go home. I don't want to be here anymore. Come on. Let's go. Come to us. Let's get out of here. But Peter, Peter put his faith above his fear. Peter was afraid. And he questioned the physical presence of Christ, but he had no doubt of the spiritual presence, the actual magnitude of the power that Jesus had to call Peter into the impossible to be with him. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to reiterate that Peter was afraid. He definitely was afraid, but he knew the voice of his friend. He trusted the love that Jesus had for him. He knew that Jesus is the only one who had all power and all authority over the storm in his life. He knew that the storm had no inkling of power compared to what Christ had. So he said, Jesus, tell me to come to you because he knew that Jesus, if that really was him, Jesus was going to come through for him at the end. Guys, it's okay to it's okay to fear. You know, it's it's a scary world that we live in. You know, and it's it's a human 
aspect to, to sense fear and to be afraid. Even Jesus' closest friends that were with him 24-7 were afraid. However, the key is to not live in fear. The key is to not let fear navigate us away from Christ. See, the truth is that we need to keep our focus on Jesus and Jesus is what's going to get us through these crazy times. Jesus is what's going to get us through this storm. And listen to this. The storm did not stop once Peter stepped out of the boat. The storm still kept going, but it was his faith in Christ that kept him afloat. There's a little rhyme for you. When Jesus calls you out of the boat, make sure it's your faith that keeps you afloat. Faith It's what's going to keep us afloat in these hard times. Faith in Christ, hope in Jesus, that he is soon returning is what's really going to get us through the day. But now I want to ask you, what what is it that's getting you through the day? Is it binge watching TV and Netflix? Is it your relationship? Is it hoping that the NBA season returns? What is it that's keeping you afloat? Because God is asking you to put all of your hope, all of your faith into him because he is the one who spoke the seas into existence. He is the one who has all magnitude and all power. Jesus alone has complete control over our lives. If we let him, if we trust him, if we have enough faith to step out into the unknown towards him. Finishing up in verse 29, Jesus says, yes, come. So Peter went over to the side of the boat, and he walked on the water. In his drowning, he said, save me, Lord. I love that. I love that. That in the hardest times, the only thing that Peter thought of, the the, the first thing that came to his mind was, save me, God. Save me, Jesus. Save me, Lord. The beauty of this story is found in that Peter began to drown. In fact, Peter had to drown. If he had made it all the way, the title of the story would not be Jesus walks on water. It would be Peter walks on water. But it is never about us. It is always about Jesus and his power over our lives. You know, before Peter began to drown, it says that immediately, immediately Jesus saved him. He didn't wait a little. He didn't say, that's what you get. You shouldn't, you, you shouldn't have doubted me. That's what, that's what you get for looking at the storms. No, no, no. The son of man, like the son of man came to save us. And he saw his friend was struggling and he didn't hesitate to save him. And this is a perfect picture of Jesus' love for us. Because Jesus loved Peter, because Jesus loves us, he doesn't get angry at us when we fall. He doesn't get angry when we start to drown and and, and cry out, save me, Lord. It's when we don't claim that love for Jesus. It's when we don't live in his love and in a relationship with him that we really begin to drown. It's when we're spiritually dry from God's love that we just start to drown in everything that the world wants to throw on us. We start to drown in our anxieties, in our fear, in our depression, but we're just one sentence away from salvation. Save me, Lord. Believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and the Lord of all, that is all you have to say, and he will pull his hand into the water and pull us up and hold us close and say, don't ever for a second doubt that I didn't have you in the palm of my hands, that I didn't have a beautiful plan for you, and I would never let you drown. I love Also, that Jesus says, why did you doubt me? You know, he doesn't say this in condescension or in judgment towards Peter. He doesn't say, how dare you doubt me as the son of God? No, no, no. He says, like, bro, why why did you even doubt to begin with? You know, it's like if you texted your best friend, your significant other, whoever, someone you really love and care about, and you said, don't eat dinner. Don't go buy dinner. Don't do anything. Don't eat because I'm going to provide for you a dinner. I'm going to bless you with food. And then when you go see that person, you realize that they're like halfway into a hamburger from McDonald's. And you're just like, bro, why why did you doubt me? Why did you think that I wasn't going to, to show you my love for you? And that's what Jesus is saying. Jesus isn't upset at Peter for trying and failing. In fact, you know, Jesus isn't, Jesus isn't angry at Peter at all. Jesus just wants 
Peter and us to know that it's okay to run to him. It doesn't matter if you fall in the process because we can always count that God will be the one to pick us up and to stand in front of us and say, I have you. Wrapping up, verse 32 says, When they climbed back into the boat, the wind stopped. Then the disciples worshipped him and said, You really are the Son of God. <laughs> when I was younger, I, um, I remember hearing this story in church. And um, I felt like there was a lot of judgment cast towards Peter. You know, the pastor had a great point. He did a good job. But I felt like people were wagging their fingers and they're like, Poor Peter. Peter shouldn't have doubted. Tisk, tisk. You know, I went to a Spanish church. I don't know why they're in a country accent, but I'm too deep now. Tisk, tisk for Peter. Peter should not have been afraid and, and doubted God. I would just like to kindly remind people that there were 11 other disciples who were too paralyzed in their fear to escape a sinking boat. There were 11 other people who witnessed the same thing Peter did, but did not have the faith to step out into the storm because they would rather have just drowned in a sinking boat. They were comfortable in their pews. They were comfortable watching someone else struggle in their way to find Jesus. Ladies and gentlemen, let me just say that this world, this world that we live in right now is our sinking boat. This world was not meant to withstand the sheer awesome power and presence of God when he returns. That's why there's so much bad news. That's why the world feels like it's deteriorating because it is. And I truly understand how scary it is seeing it all happen. But although there is this storm of fear raging outside, I can only ask that we look deeper into the storm, that we look harder into the storm because in the middle of the storm is Christ with his outstretched arm and he's saying, get out the boat. The boat's not what's going to save you. It's me. Trust me. Put your faith in me. Put your focus in me. I am calling you to the storm because I am in the middle of the storm. Get out the boat, please. Run to Jesus, family. Run to Jesus. It doesn't matter if you fall. It doesn't matter if you're afraid or if you fail. Because the second we call out on the name that has all authority and power that is Jesus Christ, the storms are silent. The moment we call on the name of Jesus, he picks us up and he looks to the storm and says, Enough. Enough. I have all authority here. And I will not let you harm my child. So in these troubling times and in these times of fear and trials, I can only urge you to be like Peter. Continue to risk everything to seek Christ despite your fear, despite what the enemy wants you to believe and live in, sedentary, in a sedentary aspect. Do not be afraid to risk it all and run towards Christ. Refocus your faith. This world is not our home. Jesus is, and he's calling us towards him. Don't fear the storm or the sinking ship, because when you realize that God is your foundation, you'll realize that there is not a water too deep for you to ever drown in. God is carrying you, and God is in control. Now let's open our hearts once again and hear the worship team, and I hope you have a happy Sabbath. God loves you so much.
every storm, through the beginning and the end of our life, God. It is well with us because it is well with you. God, may we relinquish all control over to you. May we not live in fear, but walk in faith, God. Thank you that although we do face storms, you are in the midst of the storm calling us to you. So God, I ask that you give us the strength that you continue to provide with us, provide for us your knowledge, Lord. Thank you so much for loving us. Thank you for protecting us. And thank you for your son's sacrifice. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Have a happy Sabbath, everyone. Thank you for tuning in. We'll see you next week.